thank you very much, Nathan, for that introduction. And thank you for the invitation to be here today. It's, um, it's really quite an unusual feeling after all this time to be presenting here again. I guess the last time I presented here would have been uh, maybe 17 years ago or something like that. So, <laughs> and it was quite amazing when I got here. I was really, um, I got here and there had been a car park set aside for me with my name on it. So that was quite a change from the days of being a PhD student right down the bottom. I was right down in one of those bottom rooms sharing like six students in a room. So it's definitely a different coming back today. So thank you for that welcome. Um, as Nathan was saying, I'm a mining engineer and I did my PhD here. I finished in 2015. But just before I go into the whole digital twin sort of topic, I thought while I'm here at the JKMRC, I'd really like to just acknowledge the connections to my time at the JK and also the reasons for starting Petra as well. Because it, um, Petra actually means rock in Greek. So if you're wondering what the name of the company means, I was working as a mining engineer in the 1990s, mostly in Cambelda and in Western Australia. And one of the big challenges that we had was that we could rarely mine to plan. It was a common, my job was to be the scheduling engineer. And I cannot remember in all my time of scheduling ever actually being able to execute that plan. So I, as a person who come out of uni and you're like, I've got, I'm an engineer, I should be able to design something and it's going to actually be what I expected it to be. I found that because of geology, and I know we have quite a lot of geologists in the room here, we have a very, it's quite difficult to plan and to have things execute exactly to plan. So there's a bit of noise in the, you know, in the mining kind of media at the moment around, you know, making mining more like manufacturing. But I think until we fully acknowledge how variable the inputs are to mining, we're not really gonna be successful in treating it as a process. And so largely what Petra does is really acknowledges that about the importance of geology and the importance of variability to actually optimizing our whole value chain. So a very important part of the Petra story is Dr. Jelko Pokorecek, who is also an alumni of the Julius Christian at Mineral Research Centre. She finished, I think, maybe four or five years after I did. And she's a um, founding director also of SIG, the Coalition for Energy Efficient Communication, and a metallurgist, and also a recipient of the Ian Morley Prize and the TMS Medal for Environmental Contribution for her PhD. So as we've worked together now of almost five years, what what we've both she's really started to really love and enjoy geology as well. So it's very core, <laughs> using a pun there, but it really is core to Petra's business is geology. And I think, would you like to just share with me in the room how many people who are geologists and how many are, so we've got a, quite a strong geology representation, great. And what about um, metallurgists? Is it about even numbers, okay. And not many, some mining engineers or just one, okay. Cool, well, it's good for me to understand my audience. Thanks for that. So when I talk about geological uncertainty, how did I, what was it that really was the, at the core of this problem? I mean, to my mind, one of the big issues we've got is in, from a rock mechanics point of view, which is where my mining engineering went into, I went into rock mechanics, which is all about designing um, excavations in rock. One of the fundamental problems was our ability not to measure the properties of rock at a small scale, but to extrapolate that out and to say how that behavior is going to, how that rock is going to behave at scale and across multiple dimensions, multiple, multiple dimensions as well, and time and three dimensions of space. So this is why I'm showing you this slide, is it's a, a simple point load test, one that is used quite extensively, whether you're in metallurgy or in mining or rock mechanics. And why it's important is because this is one rock type. It's got exactly the same. It's logged. The, the logging of this core is actually the exact, exactly the same. So it's got the same even um, profile in terms of the alteration, the um, lithology, the um, from a from a point of view of looking at the core, you wouldn't know it was going to behave differently. And yet, depending upon the direction that it's loaded on, or depending upon um, how it was you know, where it was slightly differently in relation to how the loads are going to go onto that, you get a very different result. So the uniaxial compressive strength, which anyone who's involved in the mechanical side of rock in the communition side would know is a measure of the strength, is you can see a huge variability between two samples that were actually only about two metres apart. 
Now that's really at the core of the problem that um, we have in mining is this variability. So how can we better uh, um, represent the rock that we are going to be processing and treating? And how do we better sample that rock? Because the other problem with testing is even though it has, it has its own standard deviation and error, so that those samples, when you do a UCS test, which we use in rock mechanics, it typically has a standard deviation of around 20% on the same rock type. And I imagine with bond weight indexes and other variables used, other parameters used in comminution, it's similar. So how do we, and that's the, very, that's the error on that. Then you go, you've got a sampling error as well, because you're only taking a very small percentage of the rock that you're actually going to process. And depending upon the variability of that geology, you're obviously going to get variable results through the plant. So for me, being here at the JCAMRC was actually a really, was a defining moment in my career. And I'll tell you, there's a couple of reasons for that. Firstly, I was interacting on a daily basis with people from different disciplines. So we had geologists here, we had mining engineers, we had metallurgists, we had um, mathematicians, all here and all sharing, collaborating and working and presenting. In fact, these JK lectures were where I learnt a lot of the, probably the only metallurgy that I really know was through coming to many and many um, lectures here where at least half of the lectures were on metallurgy. And so I learnt and from all that experience and interaction a lot more about the whole discipline of mining, not just the discipline of mining engineering or rock mechanics, but the discipline of mining professions and how we interact together and how what our different jobs how they come together. So Jelka, like me, had a passion for wanting to learn about the whole of mining. And she really believes that fundamentally as well. And so do I. Um, my PhD thesis, this is another connection to my time here at the JK. Big part of my PhD was to try and improve the accuracy of our ability to estimate the level of dilution from underground mines. Now, dilution basically means you're putting waste rock in with the ore, and that obviously is not a good way to, it causes more costs downstream, and it also um, tends to use up capacity in your assets, so you don't get as high a return on investment in that capital that you've bought, whether they be the plant or the, the underground equipment, right? So dilution is not, is, has um, operating costs as well as direct costs. And that problem, um, I tried to solve it in various ways, but the one that I, one of the ones that relates to this area that Petra works in now, which is building op models of the um, operating models based on the mine's actual data, comes back to this set, um, excerpt from my PhD. And I'll just read it to you. The possibility of developing site-specific stability charts to capture the potential sensitivity of narrow vein stopes to Q prime. Q prime is like a, an empirical index in rock mechanics, a bit like a bond weight index. Monte Carlo simulations analysing trends in the variance of the extended Matthews logit model indicated that a reliable stable failure boundary, that's the predicting whether it's going to be stable or, or fall down, requires at least 150 case studies of which a minimum of 10% should be unstable surfaces. Okay, so, and then I went on to say, the time required to collate sufficient case studies for a site specific chart is considered a significant limitation of this approach to improve narrow vein stope design. So this is back in 2005. There wasn't much data available back then. And when you were doing your PhD, I'll just advance forward, Back then, most students would spend at least their first year of their thesis trying to get data for their thesis. And then even then it would be quite limited. Fast forward 10 years and we are inundated with data. And the data, maybe the data already existed, maybe it was being stored on servers somewhere, but the ability to share that data in the mining industry was limited, mainly because of the size of the hard drives and stuff we could port around with us. But then with cloud computing becoming very much more accessible and cheap to access in around, it was probably a bit earlier than that, 2013, that enabled a whole lot of data sharing. And I'm sure many of you in the room have had some experience with mining data that has been shared with you. I would hope so. So fortunately for, for me, I'd worked with Newcrest um, for them for a few years. And one of my former colleagues, Andrew Logan, who's now the head of technology and innovation with Newcrest, um, provided me with some data sets that I was given access to in order to show what could be done with this big data. And I'm just gonna show you one of the first things that um, I was able to do with this huge data set. So 
what what's, you can see here is gigabytes of data that was used to track the ore through to the plant. Okay, so we would know based on what truck was arriving at that time, where it had come from, what its, what its block, geological attributes were from the block model, and then relate that back to space and where it came from and map that back. So this is, no, this is not modeling yet. This is the very early days. This is just seeing if there are relationships between what we see actually based on tracking and what, um, and what you know, do they, do they cluster? Do you see patterns? Because at this stage, I wasn't even sure if the ore tracking was gonna work because I had to make quite a lot of assumptions in, in that ore tracking through causes and um, um, some of the errors in the data. And I wasn't sure whether the big, the size of the data was actually gonna overcome that problem. So this was really testing that hypothesis. And what it showed was that there was enough um, I guess clustering of those properties to show that we were getting a strong signal in the data. And you can see um, some of those properties there mapped back to the block. And the, the SAG mill performance is actually in, you can't read it potentially very well, but that color on the left hand side is SAG mill throughput in tons per hour and the different shots, the different blasts there that they came from and then mapping back the different rock type variables. So we've got uh, rock type, we've got um, ore type shown, and then we've also got UCS. And what this showed was that, that that tracking was actually effective in producing a signal that could then be used for um, building models potentially. So I promised you I was going to talk about digital twins. So that I've given you a huge segue to getting us to this point. But I just thought, given where I am and um, the fact that you're, this is the JK, I thought I would really like to do that introduction. So how do we get to building digital twin software from that point? It's evolved over five years and um, what we, when I talk about a digital twin, many people will say, well, what's the difference between that and say an empirical model? The difference is the word twin. Twinning is the ability to link something that's happening in near real time to a model. And one of the best ways, effective ways to do that is using machine learning. Machine learning is a, is a software effectively that enables, it can be used to other things, but machine learning built into software enables um, a model to keep learning from the operating data. And so that's what, that's what the difference is between a digital twin model that's twin to the data. In the case of um, mining, we, it doesn't have to be updating all the time, like 24 hours, seven days a week. In a processing plant, it can, because we have live data streams. In a mine, we don't, and um, we have, data that comes through in a much longer time frame, but it's provided that data, that block model is being updated regularly, which most mine sites are updating their grey control model every day or two. As long as they update that geological model with new data, they can then re-crunch all of the geology and get new models from that data whenever they update their block model. So that's, um, that's why we're talking about digital twins. It is a bit of a marketing term and it seems to mean everything to everybody these days, but um, I still like to use it because it's just differentiates a model that is being built on a static data set from one that's been built on an operating data set. So why would you want to do that? How is that different from um, classic empirical models? Well, firstly, it can be used for live prediction in a plant. So when you have these models codified as software, it means you can do things in real time. So you can start to give, give yourself live predictions of process variables. The other powerful thing that machine learning models can do is, uh, and this is more recent, is the ability to tease out the effect of different variables. And once you can tease out the effect of different variables, then you can start to use them for simulation purposes. And what I mean by that is asking the model what if questions. So if I kept everything else the same, what would happen if I changed, um, and we do a lot in the dual and blast space with, with simulation, if I changed my um, powder factor or I changed my um, explosive type, what effect will that have? And I've got some case studies to share. The other side of it is a term which I'm going to use here because I think it's appropriate. We hear words like dynamic a lot and they do get overused. But in this case, I do believe it is truly dynamic because the way these machine learn, um, these digital twin models work in the processing plant is that they're actually responding to the variability of the ore. 
So we have, we either have live tracking of the ore to the plant through the mine's own data set, and that's um, creating what a, a copy of what ore is arriving at the plant. So that's one way. Uh, that's less is quite difficult to do, but mines are getting there with that, that enabling technology. The alternative is actually to use the plant itself as a sensor. So some of the signals that you get off the data, and I'm sure there's people here who may have rec seen and recognized this, but once you can characterize that ore using the data in real time, you have the ability then to, rec to respond dynamically to those changes and optimize not just a mill, not just a flotation plant, but the whole process so that you have a model of say recovery and that model in takes into account characterization that's going on in the mill. So we will know what ore is coming and then we have a like a way of um, determining using mathematics when that ore is going to hit the flotation circuits. So we know when that's coming and then we're able to optimize based on what we know is coming for the set points for the next six um, to 12 hours. So those set points are dynamically being optimized. It's built on a machine learning layer and then it's optimization like, um, over the top of that. From a, um, what is it actually doing? Is it, there's, a, there's different types of optimization. So what we're really doing with this kind of optimization is not a global optimization. So if you have the empirical models and you're doing this statically, if you have, um, you can explore a much bigger solution space and optimize that much bigger solution space. So there's still a place for offline exploration of a, a more holistic global optimization. But when you're running in real time and you want an optimization based upon the best operators that have been working at your mine for the last year, this is, a, this is working on a model of that mine at that point in time and telling them the best way to run that plant at that time. It's not trying to answer the question of what is the best way to operate this plant uh, forevermore. It's answering that question is how, what's the best way to operate this mine today and going forward. And it keeps learning how to do that. So I've mentioned on why I'm using the word dynamic mine to mill or pit to port. Um, I've already talked about machine learning as being a way to update models um, from operating data and that it's twinned. This, I guess another important thing that is worth talking about is the ability of machine learning models to retrain themselves. So if, when we do an empirical model, which I did for my PhD, if you get a new data set, you rebuild that model, okay, from scratch and you do it manually and you really go through the process of all the correlations and you look at your correlations and you decide which ones stepwise am I gonna build this model with. With a machine learning model, that's actually becomes automated and it will rebuild itself um, when you want it to. So that's what the terminology means when it says retrain. It's actually an automated process. You still ha have to um, press like go and run and then it rebuilds the model. Okay, that's in the live processing capacity. In a mine, that rebuild retraining is actually done more offline because it, a lot of the mines aren't fully connected yet to their data sources, although some are. So where have we been applying this technology? Uh, where are engineers using this technology now on mine sites? Uh, we actually operate across the whole value chain. We've got models deployed in drill and blast, load and haul. We've got blending um, for the purpose of th um, crusher throughput optimization. We've got models in concentrator around um, sag mills, ag mills. We've got grinding, or grinding is in that. We've got the um, crushing models as well, and we've also got recovery flotation models. And I'll give you some case studies of each of those now. Um, probably before I go much further into the case studies, something that's been, just so you're aware, because you're working in, at the forefront as well of these technologies, one of the things that people are talking about now and telling executives of mining companies is that their data isn't good enough and that what I'm going to show you basically cannot be done. And it's, I just, the reason for showing you case studies is simply to show you that it can be done. And the reason it can be done is because we can use the data to fix itself, okay? We can use other cross-validating data sources to test and hypothesize what our assumptions are. We can know when it's wrong. We can do anomaly detection. We can apply 
very advanced mathematics in order to automatically correct and calibrate the data in near real time. So I just, it's, so I don't want you, one of the things that is talked about a lot, in, especially in the technical conference, is that I've looked at the data, it's terrible, we can't do this. But the thing is, it can be done if you can work out mathematical ways to correct and fix this data as you go. So the first case study, um, I know we've got some geomet specialists here today, which I'm really glad, and some people told me they were going to join as well um, and register online. So I hope you'll find this presentation interesting. This mine, is, this case study comes from Banasai, which is in Laos, and they have, it's an epithermal gold deposit, and they had problems predicting their recovery, which, um, it just became very difficult for them. And there's actually an extended abstract which was written by their resource geologist was sort of saying they were having intermittent periods of 50% recovery. So you can imagine what that was doing to the bottom line and reporting that 50%. Okay, so they had done the traditional um, geomet program at the site and they invested more. So they didn't give up on the traditional geomet. They kept doing that in parallel, but they had a, you know, they had a serious problem they needed to respond to. And so they asked us to look at this from a different perspective, a new paradigm. And so we did that back in 2018. And this is, um, this is the case study. So we've got a video of the mine site. Um, it's going to switch over soon to the block model view, which those geos in the room will be recognize it. But what we've basically done here is tracked the ore through to the processing plant, build up two years of data, and then match that data to the actual recoveries. So there was about a thousand or two thousand records in the database, and then built a machine learning model, which then populates based on the block model variables. So there would be around, I think this one's got like 40 block model variables in this model, and every block in the block model runs that machine learning algorithm. So it has its own individual prediction based on all 40 variables in that block model. So you don't have domaining, so that's different. We do use domaining for other purposes, but not for, um, not for, this, not for this sort of um, GMA application. And um, yeah, so we've got block by block predictions. Every block has to get, this is all done um, it's obviously computationally intensive, so it needs, it's done on cloud computing. But every time they update their geological block model, they can then update that and then it, get, it basically adds new predictions to the, to the block model, right? So it's just the video has crashed it, so we, um, we're just skipping that slide. Right, so if everyone can see the, this slide here, what we've got here is predicting the Paling's great and I'm using it for life of mine planning. So in addition to you, the thing about these models is they can be used at different time horizons. So you can use them for life of mine planning or you can also use them for shorter term, shorter horizon. But this is a slide from their presentation from the complex all body conference that was held in Brisbane in 2018. Right, so I, I did say that there's quite a lot of variables in these machine learning models. The, the variables you can see on the left-hand side is ranked from highest predictor importance to lowest in the model. So if we just focus on that one on the left, this is um, not based on hypothesis testing. So I said before, when we build a empirical model, tradition, often we'll have a hypothesis we're testing. We'll choose variables to explore based on our understanding in, uh, of the problem. But with, um, with this approach, we actually use a, an automated method to, do, um, to identify which variables are important in the model. So it's, it's actually a machine learning method itself. Have you heard of random forests? So we just, that's one method we've used in the past. I know we use different ones now, but that's just, just to identify the predictors. So I think I don't get involved in building the models anymore, but um, we used to use random forest to, to rank the predictions and then build the model from that. This, um, the one on the right hand side is a different tool. It's, I think this is really good for engineers and why the topic today is about engineers using it we always get questions about what's inside the model. And so we try to be as transparent as we can and we call it a glass box machine learning. So what you're seeing on the right hand side is maybe not obvious to start with, but I'll, we'll go through it because I think it's interesting. On the right, you can see that when a variable is high, red color, then it's going to the right, 
that means that you're getting an increase in the tails. This is, this is that tails model. We're predicting tails to the tailing fan. You're getting an increase. And when the values are blue and you're going to the right, they're going down. Okay, so if it was a, if we did a SHAP plot for a statistical model, you would have only red and only blue. And they would always be on one side of that vertical line because we can't, in a statistical model, we don't have what if statements. We have correlations and those correlations, you can have some level of interaction with like AB parameters, but not like this. So what this is showing is just how complex the relationships are between geological block variables and what you're trying to predict. So for example, where you've got purple, that means that you've got sometimes where it's going up and sometimes where it's going down. And the other thing that's interesting is that those sometimes up, sometimes down correlations are due to other variables in that model. So there's interactions that are captured through this complexity. And there are, I asked one of my data scientists, there's like millions of these sort of what if statements. If this, then that goes up. And it's, um, it's that complexity because as you know, geology is highly, comp highly variable at all scales, whether it be on the um, large scale of like an excavation or whether you're looking at samples or whether you're looking at the micro scale, the level of variability we see is almost un unmatched anywhere in, in nature. I can't even think of a place other than geology, which is so complex. And so this is why I think the machine learning models are doing so well. It's because of that ability to model correlations that can go in different directions and model all the complex interactions between those variables. I'm not sure. Okay. Sorry. It is important, isn't it? Maybe it is. Yes. I think, um, no, it's good because this is why we like people to see this stuff. And I was going to say today, we have a lot of these merged data sets and I think there's a huge amount of understanding that we're not having the time to go and look at. So um, I think there's opportunities with the merged data sets to do some fundamental research and understanding of what some of these causals, causes are. And to be honest, we just, Joker and I and the other team, we don't have time to go and have that fun and do that, um, that exploration. But I'm, I'm, I think that we should be. I think we should be using these data sets to understand, to get a more fundamental understanding of some of these relationships. So I we've talked about SHAP and you may be thinking, what is SHAP? Has anyone heard of SHAP before? A couple of people? Cool. Um, basically the goal of SHAP is to explain prediction of an instance X by computing the contribution of each variable to the prediction. So, and it comes from game theory. And really the reason it works is because this whole, um, what it does is it actually makes a linear model at a very complex machine learning model so that you can tease out individual effects. And the way it does that is using gaming theory. And just a little bit of a fun fact there, game theory was actually developed by um, John Nash, who was won the Nobel Prize in 1994 for his work. And you might remember there was a movie, Brilliant Mind, about that. So this is um, an interesting merging of data science and some more... Um, economic mathematics, that type of economics is often used in economics. Second case study we have is from an open pit iron ore mine where they had a mill throughput problem, well not problem, but a, an opportunity to blend the ore to get a more consistent throughput. So the view was that they would be able to get up their throughput simply by getting a more consistent blend. And there is, you know, the whole prep, there is a, um, good evidence that you can get an improvement simply by reducing variability. And that's what it looks like back in the block model. What I, what I always love seeing the models deployed into the block model because you can see the stratigraphy. So that, that coloration is corresponding to the, um, the throughput. So we're seeing the different colors there and the different units within that um, geology. Right, now we're moving into drill and blast. This is another iron ore case study. The purpose of this one was to minimize the crusher downtime due to blockages at the crusher. 
And this one was um, done in two ways. One was to predict where it was going to occur. And the other was to work out if I changed my drill and blast, which drill and blast gave me the best result for that geology. That's that simulation purpose from a digital twin. So we, this one's been installed. Um, we able to, we're able to identify 78% accuracy, the location of oversize in the pit. So that enables the mine to be more proactive. Instead of putting the large oversize into the trucks and ending up at the little crushes, they're able to treat that material separately, secondary breakage and, and maximise the throughput of their crushes because that's the bottleneck in, as you know, iron ore at the moment, huge profits, $100 a tonne. So every, you know, every 1% that they can make increase by diverting some oversize is big dollars at $100 a tonne. Um, but this is what it looks like. Try not to be too abstract. So this is simulating the effect of that drill and blast design on crusher downtime. And what you can see here is the, it's doing two things, this simulation model. It's enabling them to look at the fraction of blocks that are predicted to have oversight at the crusher and see what effect the drill and blast has on that. So you can, they can change the, um, this model, it's the explosive density, the diameter doesn't change very often, the sub-drill and the burden and spacing and explosive quantity and the stemming. So they have some levers that they can use and as they change those levers, they're able to see what effect it has on their crusher downtime. And you can see the like 0 0.04 means 4% 4 um, of the blocks are expected to cause a downtime event if, with that particular design. So this is each row is a simulation result. The other thing that this model, or the second model, does is predict how much downtime is likely to be caused by that particular um, design. And so they can compare them. The next stage for this is to run optimization over the top of it. But most of the mining companies at this stage are really wanting to um, see the machine learning models and what, how they work. And that's why simulation is a better tool at this stage and not full automation. Because if you put an optimization over this and give you an automated response, people are gonna be a bit more suspect. They're engineers and they wanna understand. So going to a simulator gives them more visibility on what's going on inside those models. The second case study, again, it's an iron ore mine. And this mine wanted to do two things simultaneously. They wanted to, so this is where you're getting to value chain optimization. So they have two, mo two models and they were worried that if they increase their, um, what if they wanted to know what effect their drill and blast pattern changes would have on two of their processes simultaneously. They wanted to see what effect it had on dig rate, that pattern and what effect it had on crusher throughput. So when we first set off to do this project, we were expecting that both of the, both the dig rate and the crusher throughput would go up as you'd reduce your burden and spacing, like basically making the holes closer together. So you get less oversized rocks and therefore higher throughput. But what was really interesting and with this project is that we found that you can overblast. So it is a true optimization problem because you can, you can end up by doing these experiments, or well not experiments, but the simulations, you're able to experiment and see what effect it has on both the um, dig rate and on the crusher throughput at the same time, and then do those experiments. So um, why we got surprised by the result of this particular project was that the dig rate, as we decreased, um, increased the powder factor, we actually got a decrease in the dig rate. And at first we thought something was really wrong with our models. And we were, for two weeks, we went through a rigorous process of remodeling in every possible way we could think of. And it kept coming up with the same outcome. Eventually, we ended up having access to talking to people on site. And they said, yes, that's what happens because if you basically um, decrease the bulk density, which means you've got more void, like when you, when you blast a lot, you're gonna increase the um, voids in that material. So every time that they were filling their bucket, they actually had less tons. So they're needing more passes of the shovel to fill the truck with the same tons. And we, um, so that was really interesting. And so that makes it more of an optimization problem because you, you've got to look at the balance between crusher throughput, which is your bottleneck versus what impact that has on your diggers. And some mines that balance a very optimized mine that is going to switch back and forth between your fleet 
being the bottleneck and your mind being the bottleneck. So they can do both simultaneously. The other one which was really interesting, which we see at Iron Ore Mines quite regularly, is that some of the cheaper products like AMPO, ammonium nitrate um, fuel oil, have better throughput, which we were surprised because they're lower density product again. And what um, we've actually, I've been to a conference with the explosives engineers and it didn't surprise them. They actually said, no, that actually makes sense because of the nature of the, the iron ore um, rock types. And so I'm actually gonna be writing a paper with one of those um, explosives engineers later in the year. And he's gonna explain from a theoretical point of view why that would be. So it's quite interesting. The data is actually leading to show what people um, had been thinking. So that's it. Reducing the explosive density actually is a big reduction in cost as well. Another model that we have is a load and haul performance prediction model. Um, I'm just looking at my time and it's, re oh, there we are. Okay. We're, in this case, we're excavating the dig, we're estimating the excavated dig rate and improving the fleet efficiency through under tracking and over tracking. So this is with the dig rate model, we're putting that back into the block model. And this, what this means is that if they have this information available to them almost in real time through their, because we've interact, we integrate this into the, um, their real time planning software, they're able to get better estimates of their dig rates. And that means they can assign their trucks and their shovels, not their shovels, more their trucks. So they don't become over trucked or under trucked. And so you get an uplift in a fleet efficiency. That's in short term planning. In the longer term planning, it means that they can better estimate their fleet requirements. So how much, how many trucks they are actually going to need. And these models have been very accurate. We're seeing accuracies of one to 5% um, reconciled again that's their own the mining company's own reconciliation so we're predicting dig rates at one to five percent accuracy right moving into processing world now so I mentioned the dynamic set point optimization this is a case study from a open pit copper gold porphyry operation they were fortunate enough to have some degree of ore tracking to their plant already so that meant that we were able to use that or tracking data in combination with the PI, which is the plant data, and build a model which um, is able to change based on the ore that's coming to that to the plant. The objective of this one is to minim to um, minimise the amount of copper and gold going to the tailings dam. So that's what the um, function is. So we built a model of one of the flotation, oh, I should, I'm probably going to get this wrong because I'm not a metallurgist, but it was one of the um, banks, not all three of them, and then that was rolled out to all three. So we built the model, it included the upstream processes of the sag mills and um, uh, some of the other, I can't remember all of the variables, but what it was also doing was characterizing from the mill data, more giving even more granularity on that ore characterization so that when we were running our prediction models, we could A, predict what the yield was going to be, so the tailings grade was going to be, and also run an optimization on top of that model, which basically asked the question, based on your model, what set point should we be operating at? And there's some complex um, algorithms that go into this because you've got live data, online analyzers which are causing issues, and we have to be able to fix and reconcile those issues, not quite real time, but near real time. And we do that by getting the assay data back from the, and then recalibrating. We also have, um, this is just to answer the question because people keep saying to the industry, this can't be done. And it's quite frustrating. So what other things you can do to handle the data quality issue is you can have multiple models running. There's no reason you can't have, you know, 10 different models, right? There's so many correlations in these plans and so many different variables that if one of your variables goes offline, one of your inputs to your model goes offline and you can detect that in, we detect it in our software. We know when that, um, sensor has a problem we go okay there's is, there's something wrong with it let's we need we need model b substitute that model in and off we go again so what i'm trying i really want to make it a very clear to hopefully other people watch this video that this is all a do is being done it's already done so we don't need to be keep talking about issues of 
data quality in mining. There are mathematical ways to fix that data and to get these things running. The second one is a set point optimization, um, which is the optimizer running over the top of the model. The reason that we show this model to the processing plant people, they see that in near real time. The reason we do that is so that they can have confidence that the model is working because if that model goes off out of the ranges that you can see there. So we've got confidence limits of yellow and the customer defined what confidence they want find acceptable and we put that confidence in that model. If it goes out of range, then they know not to trust the optimization results. So they have a way of validating when that optimizer can be trusted and when it can't be. And that gives them more confidence because a lot of the um, black box um, advanced processing control, there's not always a, um, a way to see what's going on inside that box or the expert systems. So we learned from that and that's why we provide as much visibility as we can into what's going on inside these um, optimizations. So this is how, what it looks like. We have, when we do the optimization, there's usually a few levers that are really important to, that the, the operators have been using to get them to maximize their recovery. And is it true, it is true that there may be other levers out there that the operators haven't experimented with. We're not trying to solve that problem. We're solving the problem of, can we get our best operator to basically be teaching all the other operators how to get that best result. And usually there's like, between operators, there's like one to 3% uplift in recovery, just through these tools, being able to provide that best operator knowledge um, to every operator so they can learn from that through these models. Right, um, how, are the, how are we using it in their workflows and how, how does this get adopted? We have a lot of considerations around this sort of technology now, especially with cybersecurity, um, controlled environments. Uh, we have integration points that have to be maintained. So whenever we running this sort of software, they have an API, which basically is a way of communicating between different applications. And all those need to be maintained and supported as well. We have um, an expectation now from people using software that you don't, don't, shouldn't need training. You should be like should be like your phone. You pick it up and it'll tell you, you know, if you've done something wrong. It'll say, no, you need to do this now. So that we built that expectation and that standard into the way our software works. And we don't actually need to do training. We just show people the tool and then they're off on their own to do it from that point forward. So I did have some sh some videos to show you of um, what the software looks like, but they wouldn't play. So I'm just, it's only a one minute video. So perhaps you can look it up yourself later. Um, but the other things that really need to be able to do, as I said before, is that automated real time data correction and calibration. It's very important. Otherwise your models will not perform for very long. They'll start to degrade. Um, the other one is making sure that you've defined the problem correctly. So that is truly valuable. Seems obvious, but you'd be surprised how often that isn't done particularly well. And also, there's also a need to get internal awareness and marketing internally within companies to adopt these new technologies. Now, Petra, we're not experts at change management. We're not experts at um, business case analysis, but we do get involved in all of those things. And it's really, really important. You can't underestimate the importance of um, human factors to successful implementation of technology. This, we have a portal, this just shows you that we make the portal, we make it easy as possible for, for um, companies to share their data securely. Cyber securities are really becoming increasingly um, higher risk to mining companies. And we address that using the highest levels of security. Um, we've got project collaboration spaces. Maybe you use them already here at the JK with mining companies. That's something they quite seem quite open to. So if you're working on a project, there's tools like Slack, they're free and you can quickly exchange information. Email is quite, a lot of people in mining companies get absolutely overwhelmed with email. A lot of them almost give up, keep trying to keep up with it. So if you're trying to talk to companies and you've got a project and you want to make sure that the timely communication, I'd strongly suggest working in project collaboration spaces like Slack, they're very effective. We can have people communicating you know, 20 times a day um, without any need to use email, which is great. Uh, we also obviously, have regular touch points with all the stakeholders and we try to provide as much visibility into the models as we can using SHAP. 
Um, some of the other things we've done to help engineers to use these tools is we've done integrations with um, their existing workflows. So this means that an engineer who want my mining engineer, for example, will typically spend, and even a resource geologist will spend almost their whole workday in a, a software package, like a mine planning software package. And so we recognise that if we wanted them to use it, we needed to make it something that they could push a button within that. And I've um, and I'll show you that in a minute. The other one I talked about, which is user experience. UX means user experience design. So making it modern software that young people want to use, because some of um, yeah, the, the idea that you can it takes years to learn a software package is not really that a lot of people won't want to do that investment in it these days. Um, yeah, I've got another glitch like with this video. I'm sorry, it's blocked, stopped again. But um, I will talk about the. This is actually the last slide, pretty much. Anyway, there was one video, so I might just leave it now for questions. Hi Penny. Hi Alison. Fantastic. I always get so excited by the work you do. Um, it's really, really changing industry and it's so such a vital part of our future, the way we're going with this. Um, I've just got a bit of a big picture question. I know you've done some work predicting energy usage in the mill yes. um, from the block model and I just was kind of interested and curious about what your thoughts are with, with all of the ESG um, imperative that yep. really senior leaders are um, prioritising now. Yep. Um, where you see this might lead in terms of things like energy emissions and water prediction across the mine site? I know that we're not quite there yet, but I'm really curious. Thanks, Alison. That's a, a really good question. And it's actually one that we're being a bit proactive on because we can see an opportunity to model specific energy in the same as we do with the recoveries and the same as we do with throughput models, we could see that we could calculate from the energy and the tons, a specific energy um, estimate, which they could then feed back into the block model and use in their mine planning and optimization. Because the way mine planning is done currently, not many mines take into account the um, cost differences between different rock types in the model, um, in their block model. So that means that when they're when the optimizer that's choosing which mines, which blocks they're going to mine, when it does that, it's usually using a fairly simple constant recovery, constant um, might have might have some variability in recovery, sorry, not recovery, I mean usually has a constant estimate of their energy consumption. And so by including the cost differences in the energy, you can actually the pushes the optimizer to choose blocks that are lower energy, um, have lower energy intensity, intensity. Okay, so we believe that well, what we have done is we've told our customers that these models are free. We are not. We you still have to pay to license them, but you don't have to pay. Like you, so you do have to pay to implement them for us, but you don't have to pay to license them. And the reason we're doing this is because we really want the industry to start including specific energy in their mine planning process because it's not just good for um, reducing carbon uh, footprint of operations, it's also really a, a good economics because you're actually going to end up choosing the blocks that have the lowest, um, have the highest revenue once you've taken into account the cost of um, grinding that high, that um, high specific energy ore. And some mines have extremely variable specific energy. So we have actually done a, a case study ourselves. We funded it ourselves and we are presenting that at the um, Life of Mine conference here in Brisbane later this year. So we just, just submitted the, final, the extended abstract um, this week, the final one for that. So that's going to be a lot more detail in that presentation. But, yeah. The water one, I haven't really gone, we haven't considered the water one yet, but we should, I guess. Hello, thank you for the presentation, really informative. Um, Pia, I am actually in the kind of geomet space. <laughs> so I have a question that uh, maybe, maybe related to the previous question too, kind of fundamental for me, it's like, because we are absolutely flooded with data right now from all different um, aspects. And for example, even geology, very detailed, maybe not so much in the in the metallurgical characterization, but probably we are going to get better there too. So my question is really like, how how much variability do it really worth 
to characterize and if you have any thoughts on that because at the end it's going to go everything into the block model and then we're going to dump uh, 100 tons into the mill <laughs> so how much do we really need to put the effort in really keep characterizing all all the different variables that we we can really because we are getting a lot of info <laughs> yeah i think that's another good question i've missed your name what pia i'm pia pia thanks for that question pia it does seem to vary with the scale of mining so what where they're making their decisions at and I would say that in some operations like a narrow vein gold mine where you've got highly selective mining that it's going to be more relevant to be able to make decisions around at that scale like a smaller scale effects and then at the large scale where you're you know poor big porphyry copper mines are you do are you making decisions at you're making them at the block model scale and are, what size are those blocks I know there is a bit of a trend, not trend, but a, there's a, an innovation towards smaller and smaller block models. And I, I think the reason for that is what you're alluding to is the granularity of the data that we're getting is enabling a lot more selectivity in mining. And that actually plays to Alison's question, because when you can become more selective, because you know how that ore is going to behave and what the grades are and what the recoveries and so forth and water, then you're able to um, come up with a more selective mining process, which means you're not mining as much of the uh, waste or um, environmentally concerning or deleterious um, ore. So it comes down to maybe a, a bit of a revolution in how we do block modeling, get, bring in that granularity to make it much smaller block models, which we can do now with the compute cloud computing. And then that gives you the opportunity to use that higher fidelity, higher granularity data that you're talking about. Okay, thank you, Pia. Um, can we quickly turn your attention to some of the questions online? Um, a familiar name to you at the top there. Um, Tim, I know you has a question just relating to the automated real-time data correction and calibration, which you used. If you could just elaborate a little bit more on that. Yep, sure. That's a um, good question. So um, when you go to run a model in a plant, There'll be very, some of the online analyzers will go offline. Um, and during that time, you need to have a way of estimating, like either, there's two things you can do. You can either decide that that is no longer reliable input for your variable, for your, for your model, and therefore you have to switch to another model. So you have to monitor all of those variables going into, into your model, and you need to see if they're starting to, we call it sensor health. It's just built into what we do now. We tried to we tried to sell it as a separate thing, but mining companies didn't seem to under, didn't seem to appreciate how important it was. So we just now build it into the Maxa process and map to op optimization so that it's come standard. So if they if they have a problem and with a variable that's going in and it starts to have anomalies in it or drop out, then the other model will switch in. So we'll have like a stack of models that can rotate. And then if none of those are working, because a really important predictor isn't available for the model, and we, it's got low confidence, then they get a message that will say, model is low confidence. They can also see it, because they'll start seeing the prediction getting outside of the tolerance ranges. And that means they can then decide not to use the tool, like um, the optimizer for that time until that problem is uh, resolved. Some of the examples, if you specifically wanting to know Automated calibration is possible and we have done that. So that's like when you use assay to cross calibrate in real time with the online analyzers. And there's a whole lot of other stuff that we do around um, using multiple sources of data to automatically um, cross correlate them. And if you get the thing about the amount of data that we have is that you're able to sort of see when there's anomalies in the relationships between variables as well. So when we, we use that also in maintenance as well. So if you have a variable, it might, the variable itself can have anomalies in it, but you can also have variables, you can have anomalies in the way the variables are relating to each other as well. So it's like anomalies in, in the, um, how those variables are relating to each other. So but between all of those tools, and I probably missed some of them, um, Tim, which is a good question. I, I'm really glad you asked it because it's very topical at the moment. A lot of the big um, consulting firms are encouraging mining companies to think that their data isn't any use to them. And we often go in there and say, well, actually you can do stuff with this data, but you need to like 
accept the quality of it and you need to um, yeah, you basically need to acknowledge that it is an issue, not try and do something like build a normal machine learning model without considering that data quality issue. And um, that's how we've been able to come go solve that problem. Um, we are Thanks running shy that, on time. Um, I think maybe Anil, um, Anil's question just relating to the uptake of digital twin solutions. Um, given that there are various digital twin solutions available in the market, is there a need for convergence between the various vendors and their approach to digital twins? Yep. Um, there seems to be a lot of companies talking about digital twins. I think of it now as being like an enabling technology, a bit like a smartphone is. So you can have different applications using digital twin technology. So you have people with digital twins that might do asset health, for example. So um, they might, or they might use a digital twin for studies. So you might have a digital twin of an of the whole processing plant for the purpose of design and where, how many flotation banks they're going to have. You know, where should we, how, how big do the um, mills need to be? So that's another type of digital twin. Um, in terms of convergence, we are starting to see more integration by API so that you can have more holistic solutions. APIs are application protocol interface, I think, and it just means how software applications can talk to each other. Um, do I agree, Anil, that it's the way of the future is to get the vendors um, integrating? We already have integrations already with um, MapTech, so our software is integrated with their mind planning, and we also have in live integrations into the company's own software applications. So some mining companies are building their own applications layers now and we have APIs to service that as well. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Good answer to that question. Um, maybe we have one time for one last question. Um, I guess people in the audience, we can ask Penny afterwards, so I might just go for one of these ones online. There was one I saw had popped up from, um, which one, if any of these take your fancy, Penny. Um, but there was another one, Firehead, I think was relevant um, from Farhead from CRC or just talking about the tracking um, mm -hmm. or accordingly across referencing operational data to rock properties such as competence or mineralogy. Could you further explain techniques you would use to cross reference such data and track or um, and can you comment on the reliability of tracking or down to the downstream and its impact on model outcomes? Yep. Yep. The um, or tracking is actually fundamental to this whole area of digital twin in for, from the purpose of process optimization. And the reason it's so important is it's the thing that enables you to connect to the lot to the data. So if you don't know what ore is arriving at which part in that process, then you can't build a model of it. So underneath the hood of the shiny digital twin marketing stuff is very complex um, ore tracking technology which we've built up over now. Well, I think I first started the very basic versions of it back in 2015, but now it's, um, it's been proven now at mines that have been trying to use it or very, do it themselves for a very long time. Um, can I go into the detail of how we do that? Uh, no, I can't, but because it's proprietary. <laughs> but um, I can say that we have validated it now at a lot of mine, and mining operations. And it's the accuracy now is at the point where they are able to use it for shift, shift predictions and even hourly, sometimes getting down to hourly predictions of like throughputs um, in crushes and so forth. So the other opportunity with this ore tracking technology is once you know where the ore is in these big stockpiles, like they, a lot of the mining companies, as you know, have blended stockpiles. Once you know spatially where that ore is, there's a, another massive opportunity, and that is to optimise your blend to truly get an, an, a much higher um, increase. So smoothing and blending for the purpose of getting constant feed to the mill gives you some uplift, like that's that Six Sigma lean manufacturing approach. But when you actually look at different ores and you combine them in an optimal way using machine learning models, you can find out which ores should be blended with which ores, and you can do that experiment. And we are looking that's the space we're currently operate, working with customers in now is how do they choose which ore at the plant and because they know where the different ore is how do they choose that and blend that to give optimal um, results downstream so that to us is the next level and opportunity here 
Excellent. Thank you. Another good answer. Um, to a tricky question. I think we may close off the questions now, um, just because we are running out of time. Um, but we normally save the questions, and if there is opportunity to reply to the people, uh, okay. we might ask you if, if you have time. But in the meantime, if we could just thank Penny one more time for a wonderful presentation. Thanks.